right, what is up, guys? Welcome back to Late Night Shots Podcast, episode 111. You know, we probably have our biggest guest of all today. We got three-time world champion, Lee Kemp. So how are we doing today? I'm doing fantastic. I appreciate you ha- having me on your show. Yeah, for sure. It's, uh, it's an honor to get to speak to you. You know, I think uh, this is one I've been wanting to do forever since I saw you follow us like a while back. So it's great to get the chance to do this. So, uh, Derek. Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, anybody who, you know, had older siblings who wrestled, you know, back in the day or, you know, parents who wrestled, you obviously have heard about this guy. Um, obviously, one of the one of the wrestling greats. So, uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Um, I guess we'll hop right into it. Obviously, you know, you have, you know, world renowned documentary kind of um, talking about everything you went through. Um, in your in your wrestling career, whether it was you know in high school and then as well as in um, college, so um, I guess we'll just start with start there with the documentary. So uh, before we get into the actual contents of it, um, I guess we'll just ask you know what made you want to make a documentary about everything you went to? Was it was it just you know you decided you wanted to share your story and your life, or were, was it just people asked you know, so many you know so many questions that you figure it, I'll just might as well make a movie about it. That, that's a great question. I've never been asked that before. Um, the truth is I didn't uh, initiate it. It was initiated by a friend that I've known since college. So since the seventies. And I just reconnected with that friend um, oh, somewhere around 2005. So that's the time that elapsed. And um, That was around the time I was getting back into wrestling and you'll, the people who have watched the documentary and since you have, you'll kind of know that timing, but you know, I was in business. I was actually living in New York for a while, working for several companies. And then, um, you know, there's some things that happened, which the documentary will highlight, but anyway, uh, my life sort of took a downturn and I went through a divorce. And so I got back into wrestling. And that's when I met this friend again. And this friend said, Lee, um, you know, you're, you're kind of an unsung hero, so, so to speak. You know, I was like, uh, there should be more about you, you know. And I said, why? You know, I've been out of wrestling for a long time and I left wrestling and didn't really fulfill my goals. And I went through all that, that kind of conversation. And they said, well, you still had a great career. You still had a lot of accomplishments. And not many people know about you, you know, and so this person happened to be, uh, you know, financially okay because of hard work, you know, the person had, you know, a little bit of money and um, uh, I was in a situation where I was kind of around them on a regular basis and long story short, they had a connection to a filmmaker on Hollywood and uh, just floated the idea by this person, this, this filmmaker. And uh, the guy um, wasn't a wrestler, but liked wrestling. So knew of Dan Gable. And when he found out he beat Dan Gable, he said, I got him this guy. And as you can see how stories kind of weave together, there is no one real reason why the documentary started. It was just one thing led to another, led to another. So anyway, this, and then to, to, to make it even more of a, interwoven story this filmmaker was dating uh, a, a, a girl that was the friend of mine you know this the, the mother I was a friend of the mom and so that's why it all came together you know the the you know the the couple they were over the mom's house I didn't live too far from where the mom lived and um, the conversation came up about me beating Dan Gable and then the guy said oh I gotta meet the guy so I came over and I met, the, met, met him and, you know, he's a Hollywood actor. He's a, and that, that was more than like 10 years ago now that he started this. So now he's done some major movies and stuff. But anyway, long story short, it started out like most documentaries uh, on a shoestring kind of budget. You know, nobody was, it wasn't going to be what you saw now. I mean, it was just, you know, this guy and, and you know, his girlfriend, they had a camera and they were just shooting some stuff. And it just evolved. It just evolved. It just got to be where, you know, they went to every place I've ever lived. And uh, I gave them 
In fact, that when it started out, I kind of sat and did an interview for about two weeks, two week long interview. And I'm thinking, I thought we were just going to shoot a documentary. Why are we going through all this conversation? But it was brilliant. It was this filmmaker. Uh, this filmmaker has done some other documentaries too. But he was gathering information, figuring out where he was going to go, what he was going to do. And uh, so uh, I gave him lots of information. So as you can see from the documentary, he, he went to visit my biological mother in Ohio. Uh, Jerry Metcalf was a key pivotal match in my life. He went to, still in Ohio, but he went to the Toledo area to, to meet him. Uh, I mean, interviewed Gable for like six hours one day. I mean, you know, the clips that you see of Gable, you should see the entire interview. I mean, the guy, it's brilliant. I could almost make a, a little documentary out of that. And uh, everybody that you see in the documentary came from traveling to get to these people. And five people that are in the documentary now are no, no longer living. So um, without those people being in the documentary, it wouldn't be complete as far as I was concerned. Because I had a lot of integrity in the people that I wanted in it. So when I sat and talked to, uh, you know, the director, the filmmaker director about it, you know, that's what I wanted in it. So he went and got those people. And, and five are no longer living. So uh, if I was going to do that documentary today, and I had the same conviction about doing it with the same integrity, obviously those people wouldn't be there. So... Um, Kind of a long answer, but the documentary didn't just start and finish in a, a month. It got to a point where the excitement and enthusiasm wore off and people went back to their lives. Uh, the filmmaker went back to Hollywood and just, just a bunch of stuff happened. And so it just sat on hard drives for probably five years. And uh, he had created a, a trailer, though, at one point. And so I thought it would never happen. I thought it would never happen. I would call occasionally and it was nothing. They were all busy, you know. And the, the person that started it didn't have much to do with it other than just maybe contributing their initial money to get everybody going. But everybody was just kind of back in their lives, you know. And uh, so I used that trailer and everybody I met that I thought might have an interest in funding the rest of it would pitch it so i had to really sell it in the end i mean give you the long story because it, it never would have happened if i didn't sell it in the end i didn't sell it in the beginning it wasn't my idea to do a documentary it's kind of odd when you say you want to make a movie about yourself so i, I mean that wasn't me I, I didn't do that other people did and once they did and once it got going and once i saw that it was like gonna die it was never gonna happen because i saw some of the footage that was shot like I knew they had interviewed Gable, they'd interviewed my biological mother. They, you know, they went back to my my hometown and interviewed the pastor of my church and some of my relatives and the whole bit, you know, Jerry Metcalf. I I thought, wow, I really want this to happen. So I had to sell it. I had to go out and sell it. That was it took all my car training, all my auto training, sales training to sell this thing. And I'll mention the name of the person that stepped up six years later to actually fund the whole thing it was bradley jennings um he's the philanthropist from ohio state university and um when i approached him i guess he looked at it like i'm an ohio guy he's an ohio guy let's help an ohio boy make something happen and he he felt the same way that he thought that my career should be something that uh, that should be uh um memorialized in film so that's that's the and that's the short version of the story. Yeah, that's, I mean, definitely that's incredible. So looking back on your career, you know, you've done pretty much everything there is to do in college on the senior level. 1980, you make the Olympic team pretty much, and then the, Olymp the U.S. doesn't go to the Olympics. You know, and you don't get that Olympic gold medal. Where is that for you, put you, like, with your career? Like, are you at peace with that at this point? Or is just, there still like some thing that says, maybe I should have took that second shot? Well, I did take the second shot. I, I didn't make the team in 80, and I did not make the team in 84. I got beat by David Schultz. So I, I, I took four more years of my life and trained. And when I wanted to be done in 80, I, 
there was no way that I wanted to be wrestling in 1984. Not that that's a bad thing, but I just didn't, I, I, I wanted to be done in 80. So I did take those four years, but I, I came up short. So that adds salt in the already open wound. You know, I didn't make yeah. the, you know, the, we didn't go to the Olympics in 80. And to me, I, I don't distinguish that any different than losing really. To me, it's like, when I talk about my career, I, I, I look at 1984 when I didn't make the team by actually getting beat. People have to remind me that you made the team in 80 and you were ranked number one in the world, maybe you probably would have won in 80. I don't even think about that. You know, it doesn't even register with me. It, uh, I don't, uh, it, it's, uh, was I didn't make the team. That's how I look at it. I don't say there was an Olympic boycott. And that's why I just, I didn't make the team. And however it happened, I didn't make the team, whether they canceled, whether they boycotted the Olympics or whether I got hurt or whether someone beat me. It's all to me the same. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, a lot of people, uh, and you touched on it before, um, a lot of people don't really know this, but Dan Gable came out of retirement and entered a tournament at your weight to see if he could beat you. Because I think there was a quote he said from the documentary that was, if anybody's going to beat him, it's going to be me coming out of retirement. So he came out of retirement after he won an Olympic gold medal and was done wrestling, put his wrestling shoes up to wrestle. I want to say you were 18 or 19 years old. 18, yeah. To wrestle an 18-year-old you. What do you think about that? What was that like at 18, you know, having this Olympic gold medalist, probably at, at that point, one of the best wrestlers to come from the United States of America. What was that like for you, for him to come out of retirement to meet you in a tournament final? You know, let me just clarify. He didn't come out of retirement just to wrestle me. He came out of retirement to make the Olympic team. So he, yeah. he got convinced that he wanted to make another Olympic team, similar to John Smith kind of like what Jordan Burroughs is doing now. He he, 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 you know, he he got the bug and so he did it. So part of that process is you gotta jump back out there and start competing. So he entered, he entered a college tournament, the Northern Open, which his team, Iowa, would, nor would normally enter. So, um, uh, you know, I knew he was in my weight class. I mean, he knew I was there too and I, I'm sure he knew that was going to be a little bit of a challenge because he saw I took second in the nation the year before wrestling one of his wrestlers and uh, um, but uh, but but yeah it was uh, it was a challenge. My coach wanted me not to wrestle him actually. He wanted me to go up a weight or down a weight. He just wanted me to avoid him. Actually, he wanted me to go down a weight to 150 where I wrestled the year before, and I didn't want to. I, I thought you know this is a great opportunity get a chance to, to wrestle someone like him. And I always give the example, like if you're a great pitcher would, and you had the ability to go back in time, would you want to, you know, pitch against Babe Ruth just to see how good you were, you know? That's kind of how I looked at it. I, I wanted to, I kind of wanted to see how good I was. I wanted, I, I wanted to wrestle. I didn't necessarily think I was going to win, but I, um, but I wanted to wrestle, though, that's for sure. Speaking of that, you know, like, I think the opposite, like, if you had to pick one wrestler from today that you'd want to wrestle, who would it be? Wow. that That's a, well, I mean, you know, I'm a competitor and uh, at my weight class, I mean, I'd want to, I'd want to wrestle with all the top guys in my weight class. That'd be Kyle Dake, that'd be Jordan Burroughs, that'd be, you know, I mean, there's some other guys. Isaiah Martinez is there. You know, you've got Alex Derringer is there. I mean, all the top Americans. And, of course, you know, a true competitor, they want to see how they stack up against the best wrestlers in the world. So, Sidjikov, I think, you know, two-time or one-time Olympic, two-time Olympic champion, I think uh, he is now. Or, no, one-time one Olympic champ. One-time world champ. One, two-time world champ, one-time Olympic champ. Yeah, I mean, he's – but he can recently got beat, so – um, during my career, I wanted to wrestle against the best guys in the world, and the best guys in the world now uh, at that weight are, are like I think the Russian, you know, the the, the Russian, whoever the new Soviet is, at, at, a Russian at that weight. Um, yeah. Chimizel is always competitive, you know. 
you'd want to throw yourself in the mix to see how you are. I think there's a really good Iranian there now. Uh, that that's what drove me is the competitive part of wrestling. I, I wanted to I wanted to compete against the best, which is why I had no issue wrestling with Gable that young in my career. And uh, through, throughout my career, I always, I mean, I like I wrestled Dave Schultz 14 times. So, you know, I was wrestling the best guys multiple times. I think Kenny Monday wrestled Schultz the similar amount of times. You know, um, the top wrestlers of my day, like Yegla, I wrestled him five times and Trello about five times. And you're just constantly uh, measuring yourself against the best wrestlers. Yeah. Wrestling back in like, I want to say an iconic time for USA Wrestling, you know, you had just a couple of years after your retirement, you had Kenny Monday's match with Arsene Fadzeev, you know, Battle of probably two of the greatest to ever step foot on a mat. Kenny Monday wins gold in 88, knocks off Fadzeev in 1989, you know, probably one of the greatest wrestlers ever. Like, and then you're at the time with Dave Schultz. I think Nate Carr was probably around that time too. What is it like looking back at like that team as a whole in that era compared to like nowadays and how it shaped the guys? You know, the, the team of those eras of like, uh, I think Kenny, Kenny made the team in like 88 and 92, like a bad era versus yeah. now. Yeah. You know, the thing I could say is um, at the time, I'll, I'll just go back even a little bit earlier, the time I was wrestling, in 1979, we had seven medals in the world championships. So we were prepped. Gable was our coach in 79, and he was the Olympic coach in 80. Gable was a coach in 78 as well, but we, we took second to the to the Soviet. It was the Soviets back yet then. They didn't break up their republic back then it was just all of the soviet union uh the soviet union was second we or we were second to the soviet union and we were focused on trying to beat them and we beat them in the world cup actually in 80 you know the boycott was you know it was kind of announced but we kind of thought it wasn't going to happen but we wrestled in the world cup and that was the coveted event of my era the world cup was a big deal and we beat the russians in the world cup it was the first time usa had ever beaten a the Soviets in 1980 World Cup. It was great. I, I won my match too, and that made it even better. Um, we had six victories versus four victories for them, and uh, it was an awesome experience. So I'd like to include my era as one of those years where we were, you know, we had some great, great athletes, you know, that were on that team. Uh, in fact, Schultz had cut to 149 too for some of that stuff. So he was on one of the teams that was on the World Cup teams. But then, you know, you, you fast forward through 84. 84 was an unfortunate year. Because of the boycott in 80, it screwed up 84 because the Soviets boycotted the Olympic Games in 84. It just made those games. It, the decision to boycott in, in 80 to go to Moscow screwed up all the athletes of all the sports that were competing to be the best in the world. When the best in the world isn't there, it just it screws everything up. Um, not taking anything away from the wrestlers that won gold medals and, and medals in the 84 Olympics, but it made it difficult for me to train for 84 because I knew it was going to be, it just wasn't going to be the same, really. In my weight class, there was a really good West German, and that was the West German that Schultz uh, ultimately beat. Then you jump to 88. Now you, now you have a whole new era with Kenny Monday and John Smith, two guys who are going to win every time. Pretty much they stepped on the mat. And John Smith, it was every time he stepped on the mat. And for Kenny, it was virtually every time he stepped on the mat. And, you know, and he did it in such a powerful, explosive, dynamic, and technical way. You know, if I had to pick a guy who just was the most impressive guy of that era, it was Kenny Money. When you, when you watch the technique and the film of him wrestling, this guy could do it all. He had, he had my singles, snatch singles, high crotches, he could throw you. He could do everything, really. So uh, maybe God blessed me and him that we were in different eras. So I didn't have to wrestle with a guy like that. Um, you know, I compare him to a guy like a Jordan Burroughs type of a guy. You know, they, but, um, but that era in 88, 92, I mean, that was a time period where we were winning medals consistent, gold medals consistent. We had guys stepping up, guys doing... Uh, uh, remarkable things in wrestling. So it was a really tight period. I was out of wrestling 
then, obviously. I was thought I was when I after '84, I walked away from wrestling and, and, and just never looked back for 14 years. A little bit bitter, a little bit unhappy, but but I went into business. I had an MBA in, in, in marketing during that time period from '80 80 to '84 when I had that. You know, our team not going, I realized that wrestling wasn't something I could count on. So I went to graduate school and got something I felt I could count on. And, and that took some of my focus away from 84. But, but um, to, your, to your question, though, um, that, that era, though, and, you know, Nate Carr's in that era. And, they, you know, Mark Schultz is in that era. Um, I'm more familiar with the guys right around the, my weight, the middleweights. There were some lightweights that were in there that were awesome, very good. That, in that era, they had 105 weight class and 114 weight class too. So there were some really uh, amazing competitors that competed. And, you know, and then you mentioned Bruce Bumgarner. I mean, he's probably one of the most, if not the most accomplished wrestler in the history of wrestling. I think he, him and Alexander Medved, Medved probably yeah. are probably the amount of medals they won in the uh, in, in world competition. So Bruce was on our team all those years. Yeah, so uh, you talked about, you know, 84, you walked away from the sport. Did you keep up with it too much after then, or was it just kind of like, this is in my past? I, I tried to view it like something in my past. Uh, you know, there's things you couldn't uh, ignore, like, you know, Kenny Money winning. In fact, I went to the Olympic Games in 1988 to watch. It was still in my system. Even though I was working in New York City in a, in a corporate job, uh, I took my vacation to go to uh, the training camp out in Colorado Springs. I took one week there, then I took one week out in Seoul, Korea to watch. So I watched Kenny win his gold medal, watched John Smith win his gold medal. So, uh, so I guess it was still, I guess I was following it. Um, so, um, but it, it, it was in my past, but I was still interested in it. Um, after 88, I kind of, uh, settled down a little bit more and I didn't really go back around wrestling that much and uh, kind of tried to focus on my career, my new career. And then in uh, 1991, I got married and I got to the car, car business. That was like another wrestling match all by itself, just getting into the automotive industry. So for the next 14 years from that point on, that was a real challenge to make that business work. So, uh, it was only when I got out of that business and my life just took a turn did I kind of get back into wrestling in, in around that, in around 2005. So, 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 two, yeah, 2005. So from 1991 to 2004, I was out of wrestling, completely out, really. So I think uh, you're talking about the 88 Olympics. So one of the biggest things that happened there, you know, Alexander Karelin wins his first Olympic gold medal there, you know, it's kind of the start of like this. Uh, I want to say, you know, obviously a legacy, but he didn't lose mm -hmm. until rule on there. Like, and you're at the 88 Olympics watching that. What, what were everyone's thoughts of this guy? Cause I know Kurt Angle waiting on it and a lot of wrestlers wrestling around that era. Like, what were your thoughts? Like actually being able to witness this firsthand? You know, you knew something special was going on, you know, just because of the, his physique. And, the, I mean, he was so dominant. He was so dominant. There was no one even – it was like Gable Stevenson. It's about the only thing I could compare it to. Now, Gable, he won on the world stage. If he hadn't won a world championship, he would be a question mark. But he won. He didn't really have a close match until the finals. And he scored very easily early on in that finals match. And then the guy came back and then he won at the end. I think, I think he could have dominated that guy, actually, in, in the finals. So if Gable decides to continue to wrestle, I think you'll see a guy dominating kind of like Corellum. I think he can do that. Uh, but I think there's too many opportunities to make money outside of wrestling. It'll make it very difficult for him to make that decision, I think, because he's already proven to be the number one guy in the world gold medals. Um, he won the gold medal already. So what else is there? Unless financially somehow there could be some way to keep them competing. But uh, but yeah, just like we are witnessing something special with Gable Stevenson, unfortunately it might be short-lived, but 
it was very similar to Corona. We knew something was special with him. Uh, just the way he dominated, he dominated so much. It was, and plus he looked scary almost, you know. I mean, he, it was like, you know, the, like the Rocky movie. They, they could have casted him in that Rocky movie as Draco or whatever. He could have fit that part. Yeah, so you said you got back into the sport in 2005. So that leads us to the other probably greatest wrestler of all time. You know, Mihan Lopez comes onto the scene in 2008. First ever male wrestler to win four Olympic gold medals and does it at 38 years old and in dominant fashion too. So if you had to put those two up against each other, just like, what are your overall thoughts on that? You know those are the kind of matchups that we always would want to see. And unfortunately, they never really happen exactly that way. It, it's really hard to say because Lopez wasn't really challenged either. So I think athletes get better when they're challenged. And I think um, they would have challenged each other in multiple matches. That's like, you know, you look at the, the legacies of Jordan Burroughs and Kyle Dake. They wrestled probably five or six times already, seven maybe. It takes those many matches to really see what, what is this? You know, Jordan won the first five in a row or whatever, you know, you kind of assumed it. And like if Jordan would have retired, then you never would have seen those other matches that, that happened later. They may wrestle again, you know? <laughs> you, you never know. It depends. It's up to date now because Jordan is committed to wrestle the one at the, at the upper weight and um you know uh, Dave will probably stay at 74 for the world but um if Jordan can make it through to the next Olympics then if he wants to be on the Olympic team he has to be down at 74 again so you know depending you know we may see them wrestle again possibly so I you know I it's, it's hard to predict they had two totally different styles um when you see two athletes that don't challenge each other like another matchup might have been Gable Stevenson and uh, Bruce Bumgarner. How about that? You match those two up in their prime. You wonder how that could have turned out. It's hard. It's hard to say. You know, uh, all we can say is it just would have been a. It just would be an awesome match. So I think uh, the last question before we head back into your career, because I know we're going a little bit off track. Uh, you know, you said how you felt the era kind of ended after you, and then went into nineteen eighty eight. We have guys like Kenny Monday, Bruce Gomer coming on to scene and all that. I think we're seeing that now again. You know, James Green just retired. You know, Burroughs, Dake, Taylor are only going to go for so much longer in their careers. And, you know, you have guys like Snyder, Jaden Cox, Thomas Gilman, who are all arguably in their prime. Like, what do you think is the outlook of the USA wrestling team going forward? You know, I, I think it's always, to me, looking back from where I sit now at the vantage point I have, it seems like we always emerge again. Everything's cyclical, right? So, you know, you look, you go back to 1972 when we had uh, three Olympic gold medalists and, you know, Dan Gable and uh, Wayne Wells and uh, Ben Peterson, John Peterson, and Silver. We were, you know, we, we had a great team back then, obviously. And then... Um, and we just talked about the era of, you know, of, um, uh, John Smith and uh, Kenny Monday. You know, we were winning big then. Uh, and now we have guys on the team that allow us to win big with, you know, Burroughs and um, the other guys who were, who were winning medals uh, consistently. It will happen again. It, it always does. It always does. We, we, it, we have great... Um, Coaching, I guess you would say, uh, we call them re regional training centers now. Back then, we didn't have a name for it, but we just had clubs or whatever. We had coaches who dedicated their their time to helping young people grow, and and a lot of these coaches don't really make much money. They just do it because they love wrestling. So they help develop people and champions, and now they get on the scene and they realize they can compete and. I think the thing that has helped our era of wrestling now, the current era right now, is some uh, successful businessmen have created the Olympic medal fund, which you're aware of and the listeners are probably aware of. I mean, our Olympic gold medal lists 
they, they earned and they earned 250, they earned a quarter of a million dollars if they won an Olympic gold medal. You know, and they earn, uh, if they won a silver, they, a lesser amount, I don't know what those amounts are, and they earn an amount if they won a bronze. And if you're on our national team, the top three, you get a stipend to help you train. So none of that existed when I was competing. Um, I'm not saying this for anything other than just stating facts. Uh, prior to my era, and even during my era, wrestlers got zero. We got nothing out of it. And uh, out of all the world championships I won, I learned there was no money that could be earned because I won medals. And my third world championship, when I when I became, you know, the most successful wrestler in American history, uh, no one had won more than more than two world titles, and I won three in 1982. I didn't even get a warm up in any wrestling gear that year. <laughs> there were no sponsors. There was nobody giving me anything. And I wore, in the pictures you can see, I'm wearing the white canvas wrestling shoes. Those would be considered practice shoes, if, if you will, back in my day, because we didn't have a lot of other shoes. So we wore the canvas ones, the cheap canvas ones for practice, and we wore the nice leather ones for matches. The color ones, I got, there was a lot of nice red pair I used to wear. But I make my third world team, I got nothing. And uh, I had no warm up. And so when I won my third title, I was going to get on the award team for the Divas warm up. Not a, the USA warm up because I didn't have one. I mean, I had them at home. I just thought I would get a warm up one to make the team, and I didn't get anything. And so I was going to get on the award team with the yellow Adidas warm up in the coach at the time. And it's not his fault or anything. Um, the, the late Jim Peckham, he took his warm up off and gave it to me. He said, Lee, why don't you wear this on the award stand? So I did. And when I'm getting off the award stand, I'm thinking, well, at least I got a warm up, you know? And he said, Lee, uh, I need that warm-up back. So I, I gave the warm-up back to him. And, you know, it's like, that's just the way it was. It was no zero money. It was, it, back then, you only made money during during an official wrestling clinic that you were hired to do. There were no privates. I did, If I had paid for all the privates I did, I would have made a lot of money. But, yeah, you would work with kids, one-on-one. You weren't to ask them or the parents for money that just didn't exist back then that that whole concept didn't exist i can remember the first wrestling club called the edge uh was created when i was uh, out of wrestling living in working in new york city it was i would say that was probably around the mid 80s uh or late late 80s somewhere in there when i was living in new jersey so um the thing that keeps the athletes wrestling now i think is money Jordan Burrow, well, when you Google guys like Jordan Burroughs and Kyle Dick and all, all of them, David Taylor, I mean, they have their net worth there in the millions, you know? Uh, it's not like, like professional athletes that have like, you know, 20, 30 million, but it's still in the millions, you know? You Google my net worth, it might say, I don't know, it might say, it won't say anything. And people of my era, you know, my network would have to come from any stuff I did outside of wrestling. And uh, so that is going to, that has allowed this new era that you're talking about to continue. Because if it wasn't for the fact that Jordan can make money, I don't know if he'd be wrestling right now. I mean, he's got a family, he's got four kids. I mean, he'd have to support himself. He'd have to, I mean, he doesn't even have to take a coaching job if he doesn't want to in a college. I mean, because that's, you know, if he doesn't have that interest to want to go through everything he'd have to go through to be a college coach, he doesn't really have to do that. He could continue at an RTC, continue just like Brandon Slade, just like some of these guys who who run these regional training centers. They make a lot of money doing it. Uh, and by the way, coaches now of the, you know, back when I competed, there was over 300 colleges, D1 colleges. Now there's like 70 or so. Those D1 coaches, maybe a select few of them, they do make six-figure incomes now. You know, pretty much all the Big Ten co coaches make, you know, especially the prominent ones, they make nice six-figure incomes. We know, um, you know, Kale makes a great income, does a great job, of course. He deserves to make a great income. All the other coaches do, too. Gable and John Smith probably started that during their eras. So um, it's a viable career now. When I was coming out of wrestling in 1984, I'll tell this little story. I, I, I had taken a job in Chicago. I had my MBA. I was working uh, for an advertising agency there called Burrell Advertising. And I was in Chicago, so just right outside of Madison, just an hour and a half. 
and the head coaching job comes available in Madison. So now I'm torn, like, do I want to get back into wrestling? And so I applied for the job and I didn't get hired. They didn't even consider me really. You know, I did interview, but they, you know, the most accomplished guy come out of Wisconsin, they didn't even really consider me for the job. They chose another guy who was a local kind of guy. He was an Olympic silver medalist, a teammate of mine too, um, former teammate, but he was from Wisconsin. They hired him and didn't even consider me. They didn't even call me back. Nothing was, for, but the job was only paying $40,000 in. So that's where wrestling was at. I was making a lot more than that and working at the ad agency. So I, I wanted to take a huge pay cut to get back in the wrestling. And the salaries really didn't increase that much during the era I would have been coaching in college. Um, so I think to answer your original question, I think our the future I think looks fairly bright as long as as long as we can continue, uh, you know, paying coaches the way we're paying them. Uh, as you know, uh, ESPN publishes numbers that show. Uh, the NCAA wrestling tournament is one of the one of the best uh, events in their in their in their college venue sports that they show. I mean, wrestling does it just does well for them, and they they televise every sport, obviously. So they they do a very nice job. And so, if all that continues, coaching is a viable career, and regional training centers are viable because to have a great college team, you've got to have a way to retain your athletes that graduate so that they can train and compete. And it draws other athletes there that they could train and compete. Like if I was competing now, I was 22 years old now, just graduated. I might go out to the RTC where Jordan girls is at, you know, maybe, or with my credentials, I probably would be able to go there. They'd probably pay me to come out there. Maybe not a lot, but I could at least live and train and get better. And um, if I wanted to go to, Whatever, if I wanted John Smith to be my coach, I could go to their ITC. So that didn't exist when I competed. So now it's, so our future looks bright because of all that. And then with women's wrestling, that's a whole nother conversation. That adds a whole new avenue. I think that probably is one of the single things that, that is helping to save wrestling really. Bring rest to, to bring women into the sport in such a big way and have them compete at such a high level so quickly. I think that's one of the things that's really helping wrestling. Yeah, so I think a big thing that stems off of that is the whole NIL inception coming oh into the sport. Like you have Gable Stevenson reportedly, reportedly pulling in like mid seven figures. AJ Ferrari, who's you know knows how to market himself, uh, close to seven figures, and you have all these Penn State guys just pulling six figure deals left and right because the connections they have. Iowa guys pulling that in, you know. Let, let what, me just interrupt you for a second. Did, did you say seven figures for Gable? Yeah, because I remember uh, they were talking. It was wow. uh, something that came out by ESPN. Alabama quarterback Bryce Young was rumored to have a one point five million dollar deal, and they said Gable probably has substantially more from WWE and all the sponsors. Wow. That, but, you know, that's awesome. I'm really happy for those guys. That's good. That's great. I feel like it comes to a point where with his credentials, it's like you wonder what Kyle Snedrick could have been doing just a few years back with what but he did. Huge. But, you know, he, he is still involved in it, and he's yeah. still making money, you know, big, big money. I mean, you call it big money. I, I would say – that second tier, if you call it that second tier below Gable Stevenson, Kyle's yeah. got to be right there. Him and Jordan and, you know, I mean, uh, Kyle Dake's got to be kind of somewhere in that tier. And um, and it, really, I think it's what they do from a business standpoint uh, from that. Like if they can get uh, connected to apparel companies. I know uh, David Taylor's involved in uh, – whatever the company he's involved with. And then Brutus Br Br is, is involved with bringing athletes in like Jordan Burroughs and Kenny Mundy and all that kind of stuff. So I'm glad the money's out there. I'm glad these the athletes deserve it. They, they absolutely deserve it. So, yeah, so yeah. I think uh, what we haven't touched on yet is uh, pretty much the start of your career, like before you went to Wisconsin. So 
you want to walk us through your high school career, your experiences, and what kind of led you to pick Wisconsin as the school you want to continue at? You know, that's a, one of those, um, I call it divine appointments, divine intervention, um, a spiritual person. And I think nothing happens without um, it being guided and orchestrated by our, um, by our creator, you know, the source of all of our being, you know, um, uh, because in my documentary kind of touches on that. So uh, anyone out there who hasn't seen my documentary, that would be a way you can learn more about my life if that's something that you want to do. But um, I have to say that because it goes back to, I was being, I was adopted at five years old. It all starts there. I mean, it, I can't say my whole career starts there because had I been raised by my biological mother, maybe, I, I mean, I'm not being critical about her. I think she's a wonderful woman, but she, she had a tough life. You know, she had a two-year-old at the time I was born and she was a teenager still when I was born. So, I mean, just coming into a world like that would have made it probably tough with not a, you know, no, no male structure in the house or anything like that. And my biological dad was off doing, you know, he was just wasn't, I mean, I, I met him because my biological mother uh, put his name on my birth certificate. And so I just through searching found him much later in my life. My, my, it was, I was 30 something, 36 years old when I just decided to find them. And um, he's passed away now. My biological mom is still living, but my dad's passed away now, but I did get to meet them both, and had I been raised by either one of them, my life would have been, it just wouldn't have been the same, because I was fortunate, and I call it a divine appointment, you know, God directed these beautiful people named Leroy and Jesse Kemp to adopt me when I was five years old, and I was born Darnell Freeman, so that was my name, and uh, they, uh, they just show you, and they just to show you what, how how, how uh, just the value they placed on their opportunity to finally have a child, even though it was one that they adopted, they named me after my father. That's just what, just the legacy that they, that my dad wanted me to have. And that that's special to me when I really think of it that way. Uh, wow, I mean, they, cause my, you know, I was five years old. I mean, if you have kids or you know kids, I mean, you, you change a child's name at five years old, they'll ask you, what are you doing? I mean, my name's not Leroy, it's Darnell. I mean, it'd be hard to make a child understand that their name is now, their first name anyway, has changed. That would be, but for me, that's what happened, you know? But that happened because of what my parents wanted uh, out of me. So the legacy starts there and I have to start back there because Without that happening, none of this would have happened. And then um, during the 60s, you know, I'm a child of the 60s with the civil rights movement and Martin Luther King being assassinated. We were in Cleveland, not in the inner city, but we were in the city. Every city in America was going through just overall procedure. It was unfortunate, but it was something that showed the frustration of Black people in America, really. I mean, it was just horrible. And uh, my mom and dad wanted out of that. So we moved to Chardon, Ohio, 30 miles northeast of Cleveland. It was a predominantly white community. We, but it wasn't because of that it was white that it was better. It was, you know, my dad wanted a farm. You know, he wanted to have a different life. He wanted to be, we had 25 acres of land. And that's why we moved, you know. I mean, I'm sure if there was a choice to have the farm in an area with more people of color, we probably chose that rather than, Sure, because it, it's different. You know, when you go from one environment, an all black environment, which is where I live, where we lived in Cleveland, to where I was, you know, there's only two black kids in the whole junior high school. Just boom, all of a sudden, there might have been just, just a handful of two or three families in all of Chardon. So that was a huge adjustment. Not just for me being, you know, this, you know, being young, being 12 or 13 years old, but my parents too, being older. By the way, they were older when they adopted me. They were in their 50s, too. So that's an unusual thing, to have parents to be that old to decide they want to adopt a child. And 
That's why they wanted to adopt an older child. Um, normally, when you're five and you're still in foster care, you could be institutionalized very quickly because not many people will want you. So anyway, I have to start the story there because that started my journey, um, being adopted to these wonderful people. And I got to see modeled right in front of me example of hard work, discipline, dedication, the whole bit, you know. I, I had uh, very strong examples of my mom and dad. The work ethic alone I learned on the farm was a precursor to me working hard as a wrestler. And um, I think that that was pretty critical. But anyway, so now we moved to Chardon. So now it's a farming community. There's this kid from Cleveland, Ohio, who wants to play basketball, because that's all I really knew coming out of the streets of Cleveland. And um, I don't think I was very good at basketball. I can honestly say that. I didn't get in and play. As you can see, I never got very tall anyway. And so I, I never played. And the wrestling coach was also the gym teacher. Uh, and so in gym class, my freshman year, he kept encouraging me to go out for the wrestling team, and he did, finally. And anyway, long story short, I wrestled my first year um, on the freshman team. And the next year I made the varsity. I had a 500 record, which you might imagine. Then the next two years I went undefeated. It was a two-time state champ. So that, that allowed me to have some early su success and start to really understand that I could be good at this. And I had a great coach who mentored me, uh, Dick Captain Brock, during my high school career. And then so that meant now I'm good enough to go to college on a scholarship. So now, through God's intervention, again, I get to go to the University of Wisconsin on a full athletic scholarship. Took the burden and pressure off my parents. They would have worked three or four jobs to get me to put me to college. That's just the kind of kind of people they were. But I, I was able to earn a full scholarship to a Big Ten school. Uh, I majored in business too. I mean, I, I worked pretty hard in school to get a to get a degree. But, but I had great success in college. You know, I took second as a freshman in the national tournament. My goal going into college was to be the first four-time national champion. It had never been done before. And uh, I came up a little short. I was lost in a referee's decision overtime in 1985, uh, uh, NCAA tournament. And the next three years, I, I, I won it. So that just, just do having luck. Do, do you think you won the match? Um, well, you know, that, that's hard to say. Um, when I, well, you know what? Yeah, I, I do because I scored the only takedown in the match. You know, so by the so, criteria yeah. that they now have created, yeah. mm -hmm. I would have won. I would have won. I, yeah. I won. Um, the criteria of the who wrote each other the longest song kind of stuff, I mean, it, we, it was absolutely tied. Um, zero, zero. Um, he wrote me, I wrote him. No takedown. He wrote me, I wrote him. Now we're in the overtime, but in the first, in the first, in the regulation, I scored the only takedown in the match. We both escaped. Yeah, you should have won. So, uh, and then in the overtime, I was, you know, he he was bigger and stronger than me, so I couldn't make a mistake because he could he would capitalize on that because he's bigger, longer, and taller and stronger than I was at that time. So I had to had to pick the right takedown, so he could very easily go even on the feet if he needed to. And then on the mat, he was strong. He'd get away if he had that. Back when I wrestled, you didn't have the deferring option and all that stuff. One wrestler had to go down one period. The last period, the other wrestler had to go up. So based on that, Chuck would have always been difficult to beat because of the fact that he probably was better on the mat than me. He probably was going to get away nine or eight out of ten times. So a takedown would have had to decide the match. So luckily, I got the takedown first. And... Uh, any, any, anyway, so I think we both wrestled a hard match. We both wrestled tough. Uh, we we both knew the score was tied, and we both knew it was going to go down to a referee's decision. So it wasn't like, and it, it was close. It was close. And looking at the body language, actually, of Gable and Yeager, too, I think they thought I won. Actually, if you go back and watch the body language of that, right when they raised their hands, I think, I think you can see in Gable's body language from the time they raised Chuck's hand at the time he walked off the mat. It was like, it appeared to me as though they probably thought he won too, or that 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 I they thought that I won just from all that. But um, I still think about it. <laughs> but um, 
I would as well, because I mean, obviously, you'd go down with the legends. You know, you'd go down with Kale Sanderson and all those guys now who are, you know, there's only a select few, you know, still to this day. And it's been how long that, you know, the NCAA has had, you know, officiated wrestling that there has only been, you know, a handful of four timers. So, I mean, four, I think. Yeah, four. So you'd be, it's, you would, it's hard. It's hard to do that. And it's you would have been the first, to too. So you would have been yeah. the and, first. And, and I'll just throw this out there, too. I, I didn't retro either. I, I, yeah. I never retro and not, but Kale retro and pretty much all the other four timers retro, except Kyle Day. Because in the the Ivy Leagues, yeah. you, you, you don't no retro. Yeah. So, uh, so from, so if you write, if, I'm just throwing my two cents out there. I think, uh, if you look at which which accomplishment was was bet, not better but just more challenging i think to win it as a true freshman is more challenging than to already be pretty good and then have to a year you can just still get better and now you jump into your your college career so uh so had i waited redshirted i mean it might it would have been an easier task certainly not you know not a give me for sure and I think uh, I'll throw the name Joe Williams out there. Joe Williams probably would have been the first four timer had Gable not pulled his retro year right before the Big Ten tournament. To me, that was un- unfortunate for Joe because Joe could have done something that would have been special to be a four timer. On the topic yeah. of four time national champs, uh, next year is probably going to be one of the craziest years. Probably not as crazy as this year with all the fifth year, sixth year, seventh year seniors. But you have Spencer Lee and you have Yanni Diakamalas both going for their fourth national title. You know, if Yanni has one loss on his career, Lee has like probably four or five. Yanni's already made a world team at this point. If two guys win their fourth national title, I think the biggest question is where does the Hodge go? But another thing is like, where do these two guys stand, like, amongst, like – because, you know, if you go to the bottom of the top ten all the time, most people have, like, Zane Rutherford, Kyle Snyder, David Taylor. And that's crazy enough to say with all those guys have accomplished. Like, but where do these guys stand among that in your eyes? That's that, that's a great question, I think. Um, and, and that's a good question because it shows we have American wrestlers that are emerging and being great. I look at uh, Russia, right? It's hard to pick a top Russian because they're all good, you know? They they go to the world championships and out of 10 weight classes, they may win six or seven of them, you know? They have, so that is similar now in our country. Like you mentioned, you, you've got, you know, Yanni, you've got Spencer Lee, and there's others too. I mean, I don't, um, that they want to have their shot and they will have their shot because they're good enough to get their shot. You can go right from the lighter weights on them to the heavyweights. And yeah, Schultz is obviously team. probably going to make the Greco team. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think US's Greco team has been you know something that has been like lacking. You know the USA's Greco team, and I think that I think they're going to be on the rise though the next couple of years. There's a lot of young guys who are either about to be in college. Or, or like have I like already in college that are really good at Greco? I, I absolutely agree. I absolutely agree with that. And, so, and we yeah. should get better. We should get better at it. I mean, we, we you know, it's an Olympic sport. We, we need to be competitive there. So I think uh, anybody who's seen the documentary, you know, they saw that you really wanted to go to Michigan State. <laughs> Michigan State was the college of your choice that you – were set on and they didn't have a full scholarship for you so you thought and you send out you, you go to wisconsin you get you, you know get the full scholarship offer obviously your parents are saying hey go go for the full full ride so you send off your letter of intent and that night that you sent the letter of intent off you get a call from michigan state's wrestling coach Tell you that they have a full athletic scholarship for you. So what went through your head right there where this isn't like, you know, today's age where you get a scholarship off and you could just text the coach, you know, hey, you know, I don't, I don't yeah, hey, I'm in or hey, I'm sorry. I, I changed my mind. I don't want to commit to this school. I'm actually going to commit to here. So, I mean, back then, though, it was different. You had to sign a piece of paper and mail it off. 
Caleb. Yeah. So you just put that paper in the mail and you get the call from the Michigan State coach. What's going through your mind that you just, if you would have waited a couple hours late, a couple, a couple hours later, you would have gotten that opportunity to wrestle at the school you wanted to go to? Well, it was actually overnight. Like I, overnight. I waited. See, back then, um, I grew up in an era where stores closed at six o'clock at night, believe it or not. You know, was, so I went to the post office at the last moment before it closed. And I dropped it in the mail because I waited. I was waiting. I was waiting for the call, actually. I was waiting for the call. They told me they were going to call me. I, I had the letter was sent of the whole scholarship in my hands at Wisconsin. And I, I was not going to mail it because I was waiting for them to call me. They didn't call me. And my dad and I went to the post, you know, went to the post office. We mailed it, drove back home. That next morning is when they yeah. called. First thing in the morning. So ha had I waited just one more night, I would have been, I, there's nothing that would have not pulled me to Michigan State. I, because Pat Milkovich was there. He was a mentor of mine. He was the guy that I looked up to from the Cleveland area. Stan Desick was there. He was a coach that I got to know uh, my junior year. Stan, and I have a great relationship with Stan now. I'm sure that would have been an awesome experience. But our creator had more wisdom. He, he had a different plan for me because arguably I couldn't have had a better career than I had. And we always beat Michigan State too. So that would have been frustrating to be there and to be getting beat by, by Wisconsin. And, you know, we beat them every year. You know, we smashed them basically. So, and they, they've never really had a good team since those early years of Grady Penninger, even before my era, like in the 60s. Uh, I'm, I don't know what they're like now, but but anyway, but still, I, I would have gone there. So for me, it would have been a good fit. I would have worked out with Pat Milkovich. I would have worked out with Stan. Stan was actively competing. In fact, I lost to Stan to make the Olympic team in 1976. I was an alternate to him. So we would have been workout partners a lot. Uh, and maybe that would have been good or bad. Who knows? Uh, maybe it have been maybe good for me. I could learn how to beat him, and I would have beat him But to make the Olympic team in 76. But Probably not. I think I think we would have made each other better. Stan proved he was better than me, though, and uh, and I think I would have just really worked hard. And Stan probably um, Stan didn't stay at Michigan State. Well, I guess he did. I guess he left to be the national coach later on. But but to your point, your original point, it was tough. It was a tough phone call to to listen to when Stan was the one that called me. And he was really excited and he was just talking. He was just really, really excited. And I had to, I had to listen to him go through all that, which seemed like minutes he was just going on. Really, Lee, we're excited to have you, blah, blah, blah. I said, Stan. I said, I, I mailed the letter off. It was just all silence. I felt like I had done something wrong. I felt like, oh my gosh. Is there any way you can get the letter? <laughs> I'm like, I'm thinking, well, maybe and go to the post office and get it. Sharon is a small town. So to be honest with you, I probably could have gotten it because I got a letter once someone wrote Lee Kemp, Chardon, Ohio on it, and I, I got it. That's how small the town Chardon was. So <laughs> no house number, no address, just your name. No, nothing. That's it. Just Lee Kemp, Chardon, Ohio. <laughs> so we probably could have gone to the post office and we could have told our story. And they might have given us a letter back, who knows? But, but that's not how it should have been. You know, it, it, it happened the way it was supposed to happen. Yeah. I mean, and obviously, that, you had a, an amazing career at Wisconsin. So, I mean, if you just want to talk a little bit about that, about your time at Wisconsin, and, you know, obviously, there were some, some major events that happened, you know, while you were there. So, um, yeah, you could just talk a little bit about your time at Wisconsin and everything that happened while you were there. You know, um, I've had a chance to really reflect on that now for all these many, many years back. This question would I give you a different answer 20 years ago, 30 years ago than I can give you now. Um, you know, and we live in such a politically charged world where race is such a big issue now. And, you know, I went from Chardon to Wisconsin, two predominantly white environments. 
and um, because of the racial things that have happened in our country through all of its 200 plus year history here, that's always sort of an issue. You know, I'm sure there's always people that, um, you know, might see me differently in that place, sort of, you know, but, um, uh, but anyway, long story short, I, I, I get to Wisconsin. I had that background being in charge, so that helped me, I think, be in Wisconsin. I knew some other athletes, football players and other players who were, who were black, who, who had a tougher time because of the environment there. Um, not a horrible time, but a tougher time. You know, it's always, it's always, it's always. And I think as a result of that, Dwayne Club and the head wrestling coach uh, paired, you know, uh, paired me into a rooming situation uh, with another black athlete. He wasn't a wrestler, he was a track athlete actually. And the coach realized how important representation was. And I, I'm bringing it up because I think it's important. Um, because I think that made a difference. Rich Hands was his name. He was a Big Ten champion track athlete. Um, there was four to a room. You know, my, my roommate was John Bardis. He and I are dear friends to this day. He was from Illinois. He was a good wrestler from Illinois. Uh, and then in the other other bedroom in the in our in our apartment uh, was uh, Rich Hands and another athlete. So, I mean, yeah, it made a difference have the representation. And then the next year, my sophomore year. Um, the coaching staff recruited Dave Evans, who was a black athlete out of Chicago area. And Dave ended up being a two-time All-American at Wisconsin, you know, third place finisher two years in a row. And Dave and I were, were roommates. So I have to say my experience in Wisconsin, I can't talk about that experience without that because without that, having that representation, it would have made it difficult. It would have been difficult because, you know, being the only black guy on the team, and you know, I, and I was at Chardon too. People don't realize how I wouldn't say difficult, but it, it's you know, it's 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 a little bit of a challenge always being the only black person in the room, always, and that's kind of how it is in America because we're we're minorities in America. So to have another black athlete on the team, it made a difference. You know, we come from a similar culture; it just makes it comfortable, and I think. Our coach recruited Dave for that reason, other than the fact he was a great, great wrestler too, but he made an effort to get some black athletes. And now you see black athletes are fitting in all over the country. Like uh, Kale Sanderson obviously just recruits talent and he knows that some of the black athletes are what he needs to get to have the talent. But I think, I think maybe another side of it might be that he knows he needs to do that. Diversity is healthy and important. There are some places that I don't think they don't embrace diversity, so they go get talent. And they don't really focus on maybe trying to get people of color. So, um, since I left Wisconsin, um, I see a lot of that uh, diversity there, at least on the wrestling team. Uh, I don't know why 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 that is or isn't, but I think um, I think the last guy they had on the team. Uh, uh, but but anyway, so my 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 experience at Wisconsin was healthy one because it gave me an opportunity to see how the world worked, to be in a, in a predominantly white environment, a successful environment, a very good college, a very good academic institution, and to have black representation from, you know, Dave and uh, they recruited an, an, another, or not recruit, another black athlete came on the team named Kim Ferrison. So my junior year, we had three black athletes that actually were on the team out of the 10 weight classes. So that was kind of a that that was a first back then, really, you know, because, um, but um, now with that being said, I've got to talk about Russ Allison. I think my success at Wisconsin was there, happened primarily because we had an assistant coach named Russ Allison. He was a young athlete. He himself was still competing. Um, he was Olympic bronze medalist and uh, Olympic silver medalist in the 1976 Olympic Games. He was our assistant coach. It was his technique that he, you know, he he brought to the program. He was the architect of that technique. Um, he studied wrestling from all over the world and picked some of the best Russian technique, brought it into our room, and that snatch single is what 
he taught, he was teaching our team. And so our Wisconsin team had, I mean, we had created a style of wrestling that no one had ever, no one, no one was doing. Uh, we had some athletes in our team who were so superior on their feet that they would take people down and let them go. Nobody was doing that. That happened during the Myron Roderick era of wrestling. If you go back that far, when that era ended from Oklahoma State, nobody was doing that. So when Wisconsin started to take people down and let them go, we were being criticized because you know the teams that couldn't beat us, they were saying, well, you guys aren't wrestling. You're just taking, taking us down and letting us go. That's not total wrestling. Russ brought that to us. And so I picked up some of the skill sets that I used to win all my world titles. The snatch single, single leg on the feet. I didn't chew to my knees that often. That translated to me being a great wrestler on the international scene, not just the college team. Um, he worked a lot on controlling tie-ups, which wrestlers don't, as you can see, wrestlers don't like to tie up today. They shoot with, from space where I, I grew up in an era where we wrestled from tie-ups, strong tie-ups, learning how to control the tie-ups, learning how to shoot off a tie-up. So we had totally different setups when I competed. The setups today are more just athletics, athletic, not just athleticism, but like movements to get fakes and get people to react to shoot, where I control a tie-up and get a shot off of that, or move the guy from a tie-up to shoot totally different. I learned that there. I look at how I would have uh, progressed had I gone to another place and it would not have been the same. There was nobody doing that type of technique. Our best wrestlers always beat the best Iowa wrestlers, you know, when Gable was there. When Iowa was running their 15, 16 national titles, those early nine or 10 titles, you know, or I guess those first six titles, well, I was there, first five titles I was there, I guess. Our best wrestlers always beat their best wrestlers because of the technique we, we learned there. We just didn't have enough uh, people that believed in themselves to have a, a, a team that could maybe win a national title as a team. My sophomore year, we had three, three, three champions, which was huge at the time. It's still big. If you have three champions from one team, you would consider that to be very amazing even now. We missed the team trophy by half a team point. Back then, they didn't give team trophies to fourth place team, but we took fourth by half a team point to uh, Oklahoma or uh, I, I think maybe I think it was uh, Iowa State. Maybe yeah, Iowa State took third. My senior year, we also took third or fourth. I mean fourth. So we have no team trophies to show for those great efforts because they didn't give team trophies back then. I think. The, the Wisconsin program led by Dwayne Clevin, the head coach, but Russ Hulk's the assistant. I think that's a story that should be told because we were great. Again, our best wrestlers, we had uh, our, our three, well, the three champions, they, well, the year I won the national title my first year, we had two other champions, uh, Jack Ryan won at 126 and Jim Haynes at 118. Uh, we all won world medals too. We went on. Jim Jack Ryan won, won a bronze medal in the world championships. Jim Haynes won a silver medal in the world championships. So all of us were pointing toward the 80 Olympics. When the boycott became imminent, Jim Haynes and Jack didn't even try out. I wasn't going to try out for the team. It didn't mean anything to me just to make a team. Um, it did, did, didn't mean anything to me really. I, I My coach convinced me to make the team. So I, I owe him that. He, he had a way of challenging me in a way that would motivate me. And basically what he said to me is, but Lee, even, okay, you're not, you know, I know we're not going to the Olympic Games, but we're, we're still going to select the team. So are you going to let Dave Schultz make the team? And one day you're going to look back on it and see his name there. And you know that you should have been there. You should, you should go make that team. And he challenged me. I told him, no, I don't want to go. I don't want, I don't want to train. No, I'm not going to. And so I didn't go to the Olympic trials. He stayed on me to the, to the point where he said, I can get you into the training camp and you can, you can, you can make the team from there. You can work your way up the ladder if you want. And, and he, he challenged you one more time. You're going to go let Dave Schultz make that team. And he said, Lee, one day it'll be important to you. 
And you know, he was right because I did not make the 84 team. So I never would have been an Olympian. So, so Wisconsin, a lot happened there in my life. Right. A lot of, I had, um, uh, and an academic uh, advisor there um, too, several actually, several professors that believed in me. Jack Nevin was the name of a professor there. Um, he'd be pretty old now. I don't know if he's still around or not, but he encouraged me to, uh, to keep plugging ahead to get my business degree, even though it was hard. And he, he, he understood the fact that I was an athlete too. Some professors don't care about that. They they say, well, you you know, pick one. <laughs> you know, you're you're in school when I'm not gonna change the standards, and they shouldn't. I'm not gonna give you any breaks. You either make make the cut or not, you know, in school. And uh, I don't care that you have to miss four or five days being at the national tournament. You know, you have to take this exam today. Stuff like that, you know. So I, I went through some of that. A couple of professors that made it really tough for me. Um but Jack Nevin was a name, a guy who really encouraged me to keep forging ahead. And he was he was on my graduate school. I ended up getting an MBA at Wisconsin too. So when you ask me how the things, how how do I think about Wisconsin, those are the things I have to think about because it changed my life. I I, I had a great career, made great friendships, had a great coaching staff. It was the perfect coaching staff. I had coaches that could motivate me. I learned the technique that allowed me to become three-time world champion there that I would not have learned someplace else because nobody was teaching it. No one does it. Like even now, um, no one wrestles the way that I wrestle. Um, although, uh, like my son, if you watch my son, which I appreciate, thank you for having him on your, on your podcast as well. I mean, you look at the way he wrestles. I mean, it's not all me. I mean, he's his own person. But early on, I showed him stuff and it allowed him to, and he picked it up and he does it better than anybody. Like when he scores on a single leg, I think it's better than anyone in the nation. No one scores from the feet the way he does, even the top wrestlers that I see. Um, so without Russ being there, without Russ being, um, and I used to work out with Russ too, actually. He used to, because I needed someone in the room that could beat me up, you know? to grow because I got to be the best guy in the room. And you know how that is when you're the best guy in the room, then you're the best guy. How do you get better? I wanted Russ and I, I would seek him out and he would work. And he wouldn't just use his weight and strength because he was a 220 pounder, a strong one and a silver medalist at that and should have been a world champion actually. He was, we were on the world team together. He was a silver medalist and lost to a Russian he had beaten three times earlier. But we used to work out together occasionally. And uh, so without having someone like Russ there to mentor me as a, as a young athlete uh, and a guy who could uh, uh, provide the kind of technique that we we got there, my career could have been all together different. So that's why I say that life, a lot of it is divine appointments. You know, our, it just doesn't happen from our own doing. It, it just comes from something a source greater than us. And, uh, and I certainly experienced a lot of that. Yeah, I mean, um, you just touched on it. I mean, I'm sure you kind of, obviously, you know, um, your son is, you know, he's a D1 wrestler at Cal Poly. You know, we did an episode with him as well. So I'm sure you're proud of him, you know, how far he's come. You know, obviously he was on a team, uh, you know, he was on Fresno State before he came to Cal Pal. Cal uh, Cal Poly. So, I mean, obviously, you know, what was that transfer like for you? You know, I know he said he was really upset. You know, he thought his career could be over. You know, he didn't know if any other school was going to take him. So, I mean, what was that like for you, you know, kind of watching him and now obviously watching him wrestle at Cal, you know, Cal Poly, I guess, you know, what's, what's that like for you? Proud, proud dad moment? You know, it, it is a proud dad moment. And I think because of, uh, and I keep referring back to the documentary, because you've seen it, you know what I mean. There was a yeah. period where I wasn't around my kids at all for about five years. So um, Adam and my youngest daughter wanted to come live with me. And Adam was 10 years old. And so he had no exposure to wrestling. And he actually tells me that, uh, like one of the trips when I came to visit my kids, you know, when, I, when, when they were not with me, 
I gave them a wrestling poster. And my son tells me, I didn't know that was you, Dad. I yeah, just, he, well, he told us the same thing. He told so, us the same so thing in the that, podcast, yeah. So that, that's how disconnected my kids were from me. And my daughter, when she came to live with me, she was a junior in high school. And she came home after like the first couple of days and said, Dad, these boys keep coming up to me asking me, well, you're, you're Lee Kim's daughter? You're what? You know, like, Dad, why are they doing that to me? They're just coming up to me. I, I don't know these people. And, and, uh, and I said, might they, are, are they wrestlers or, you know? And I said, did you ever Google me? He said, no. I said, you know, I was a pretty good wrestler. Uh, and it turned out that a lot of these boys were wrestlers, you know? So that's how disconnected my children were from me, from who I was. And so for Adam to have gotten into wrestling is uh, just a divine thing. It's a, a spiritual thing bigger than me that guided me and him because he weighed like 80 pounds you know, when he was like in eighth grade or seventh grade, when he started wrestling, eighth and ninth grade, 80, 85 pounds. He was little, he developed late, he was skinny. And, and I, I kind of wanted him to wrestle just to get tougher. I had no idea he was going to become a scholarship athlete and as good as he was, had no idea. And, and he didn't even want to wrestle. And I don't know, I don't get into that's a whole nother story. I, I kind of made him wrestle. I kind of forced him to wrestle. But I saw that there was something in him that was different. He, even though he didn't have the same skill as the other kids, he fought hard, he never quit. And he won most of his matches. You know, like he won the conference tournament in seventh and eighth grade. And so he's thinking, okay, I'm done wrestling. <laughs> Gets to high school, I'm like, okay, we're going off with the team, right? And he's like, well, no, I don't really want to wrestle. So, so it wasn't really in his brain yet that he could be a good wrestler. I had to keep grinding on him a little bit and I think his junior year is when he clicked for him he he just went to state I wouldn't say out of the blue but so I was really proud that he went to state and I asked him like how oh. he beat a couple guys that he had lost to during the year and he was one match away from placing as a junior and as a senior he took fifth and that enabled him to get the attention of Troy Steiner from Fresno State and Troy had come to the wrestling uh, club of Izzy Martinez, Izzy style. My son, Izzy allowed my son to go there. And uh, I, owe, I owe a lot to him, Israel Martinez, because he helped groom Adam. And I I didn't go in the room either. I think that was another thing. I, I maybe threw some knowledge, I don't know where it came from, but it just, I realized that I need to just let Adam develop. So uh, I dropped him off, let him go to the practice and Izzy groomed him there. and. And he became one of the best wrestlers in the state of Illinois. I mean, you know, in terms of, he was fifth, but, you know, he lost by one point to the guy that made it to the finals. So he, he was good. He, he could have made it to the finals even his senior year. And uh, the guy that won the state tournament in his weight class, he teched in, in the freestyle state. So he, he was starting, he was just on this path. And he was in the room with Will Lewan, you know, that name, you know, Will Lewan came out of uh, Martini Catholic uh, High School where is he Martinez, uh, coached and Will was in the in the club and Adam got to work out with guys like that so yeah he, he made me proud almost every day watching him just grow and take on all this responsibility and uh so uh you kind of went through the whole story of the president dropping the program I thought maybe his career might be over because he wasn't so sure you're right he was going to get picked up anywhere and we were already living in California. We're thinking, oh my gosh, you know, there weren't, wasn't that many colleges that wrestle out West. So we're thinking maybe, oh, I might have to go back to the Midwest. Cause I think, you know, we knew, um, you know, some coaches in the Illinois area and Indiana and, you know, Wisconsin really didn't show any interest, but um, uh, we didn't know, we didn't know what we're gonna do. We just didn't know what we're gonna do. And doors open and, uh, God, you know, open that door at Cal Poly, and it's been a great situation for, for both of us, because I tell him, Adam, on a regular basis, you know, he enhanced both of our lives, because I wouldn't be in, he wouldn't be in California, wrestling for a great academic institution like Cal Poly and wrestling for them, nor would I be living in California, and I love living in California, it's, it's a great experience for me at this point in my life, uh, to be closer to my other two children, too, they live in California in the LA area. So um, yeah, for me, it's just, uh, he's already exceeded any expectation I had for him as a wrestler. So it's just, it's up to him now 
to do what he thinks that he knows he can do. He tells me he can be a national champion, and I believe him. He's got the ability to do it. He's very smart uh, in in all levels, not just wrestling. Just h- how he relates to the world is is, a, is very interesting, very unique, and very impressive. And my other two kids too. Um, my son Jordan is an entrepreneur as well. He's, he didn't get to wrestle because he didn't live with me, so uh, he never uh, developed that way. And my daughter came as a junior, but she she does well, has a great job, does really well, has a lot of a lot left in her in terms of her potential, what she wants to accomplish in her life. So, as a dad, I'm, I'm really proud of all of them, and uh, and I get to see them on a regular basis, so that's cool. Yeah, definitely. Um, I know, obviously, when we talked to Adam, he had a lot of, uh, you know, he had a lot of faith that he would definitely, uh, he'd definitely be at least an All-American in these next upcoming seasons. You know, he said that was his goal was to, you know, to get on the podium and get that All-American status. So I definitely think we could see that. And I, I agree with you 100%. I think he's got the talent to to definitely become an All-American, and get that, get his name put in that book that you know that nobody could ever take away from you that you're an all-american so i I definitely could see it definitely (laughs) you good Uh, i um as as you said i yeah he definitely has the ability to do it it's just a matter of um you know as as anything in life you've got to kind of put ourselves out there to make it happen and he's in the right environment got a great coaching staff uh he's got the motivation because i talked to i see him on a regular basis i mean it's always on his mind so uh, i can't see it not happening really i mean i don't want to put that kind of pressure on him but i mean i i think he's got the accountability that he you know that he can win you know he he could be a national champion you know he could um all it takes is somebody to step up and do something that people didn't think they could do, maybe, you know, or, you know, I think a lot of people that are around him believe he can do it too. Izzy Martinez always said that Adam could be a champion. Um, that even back then in high school, he was always impressed with, with Adam. So, uh, so, uh, so just proud father just going to sit and watch and I'll be, I'll be okay with whatever happens. I'm, I'm, I'm already proud of him. You know? Yeah. Is this like more of like, I want to say like a full circle moment because, you know, you've already competed, you've done your thing, you know, and now you get to see your son carrying on your legacy pretty much, you know, and building one of his own. So it's just, are you just kind of like, I want to say like at peace with what you've done, essentially like your job's kind of complete at this point? You know, it's not complete. I think we have to go through life challenging ourselves. Uh, in fact, Adam challenges me on a regular basis. He says, Dad, what are you, what are your goals right now? What are you, what are you trying to accomplish now? You know, so he's he's pushing me to be better even. So uh, so yeah, I, I have things I want still want to accomplish, not necessarily with wrestling or pushing him to do wrestling stuff. I mean I, I want to uh, um, I think I have a uh, a story that can motivate people. So I have had the opportunity to tell my story in, in, in settings where I've you know, been asked to, to give my story as a, a keynote speaker of various events. I like to do more of that. Um, I'm, I'm, in the, I'm in the final stages of a book about my life that kind of follows the movie a little bit. And who knows whatever else. You know, I, I'm, I love traveling. COVID kind of hurt that a little bit, but hopefully things are opening up now and I'd love to travel. Um, I want to travel travel to Africa. I mean, I've I've got uh, I, and, I, and I will do that. That's something that I have a strong desire to want to do. Um, it's funny growing up in America, um, just the way Africa is placed in the minds of the people that control the media and all that stuff. Africa doesn't doesn't first pop into mind as a place you might want to go for some reason, just because of the, all the stuff that's happened in America. But it's a beautiful place. I'm learning about it and researching it. And it's a place I, I want to go. I want to, I, and, I, and I will go. So I, I will do some traveling. It's, it's God's will. I mean, hopefully everything uh, will go the right way. I mean, I'm not a young man anymore, although I, I have a youthful 
uh, exuberance and all that stuff. I, I work real hard at trying try to stay healthy. Um, in fact, if you ask me what what are my goals, in fact, my son asked me recently, I said my goal is to stay healthy. That's a, that's my number one goal, to focus on my health and stay healthy. And so, uh, but I have this opportunity to help him if I can achieve his wrestling dreams and goals. Uh, I moved to Cal Poly to be near his career and to work in the RTC there. But that's not the end. You know, I, I mean, I'm here. I love being in California. I could be somewhere else in five years. So, uh, um, so it's, uh, it's a journey. And all of us have to keep on that journey. We never, it's never, I mean, I, I hope it doesn't stop. Because if the journey stops, you know what that means. I mean, we're done. So we have to keep moving and stepping and figuring out where we want to go next and what we want to do next. And yeah. my, my life has sort of been one of those. Yeah. I think one thing we have to touch on here is some of the crazy things you did during your career. So you figured out a weight cutting technique that you could be between five to seven pounds overweight. And you had this one workout that you would do that you knew would always get you back down to weight. And this is, was this something you did your entire career? Was this, this run that you had set up? Yeah. You know, back then you could wear rubber shoes and stuff. So I knew if I um, put the sweats on, the rubber suit on, and this is in Ohio. I mean, it got cold and it snowed and stuff. So, but you put yourself, get yourself hot enough, you could sweat, you know, and I'd run really hard for about 30 minutes sprints you know and then i'd go uh just sit in the warm house you know i lived in ohio then and even back in wisconsin you know i'm um i could all i could always count on five or six seven pounds i would lose like nine pounds in a practice at wisconsin you know just just one one two two and a half hour practice i'd lose about nine eight to nine pounds Sometimes. So, not not every time, but I could lose that much in practice. So what was the fascination with donuts? Because I know <laughs> we talked about it, you know, during, you know, you know, of course, usually when we have like, you know, normal, more obviously not such legendary guests on, we would ask them some really dumb questions about food or about this or about that. So I feel like I had to ask, what was with the donuts? Was that just something you enjoyed while you were at college or was that like? It, it started in high school. In high school, yeah. You, you know, when... Like, uh, there's some crazy numbers people a, were saying. Like, what? Somebody, somebody, I want to say in the documentary, somebody said you'd eat, like, six or seven donuts. Uh, I don't know if it was that many, but um, but but we'd... I, I would. I wouldn't say we. I guess I was kind of by myself, really. But I'd skip school and go to the this donut shop in Chardon, a small town in Chardon, but at this donut shop, you know, and I get donuts. You know, I think when you work hard at something, you've got to have some, some, something, some kind of, I wouldn't say a release, but just something that you look forward to. haagen ice cream was that sometimes when I was training uh, in college. Sometimes, because when you're training, burning that many calories, you can eat a whole pint of haagen ice cream. It's not a big deal, you know, you can do that. And so I would work hard sometimes and I'd look forward to that sometimes. Um, yeah. Just sitting and enjoying it, you know, or enjoying a nice uh, jelly donut. That was my favorite, you know. But as I've learned quickly, as you age, you can't, you can't do that. You gotta, you, gotta, you gotta curb that a little bit. I don't do it now, but, um, but yeah, I, I, I did. It was, it was an ongoing thing. It was constant, there was a donut little donut shop that say it opened like late, like 2 a.m. after, you know, the clubs closed and all that kind of stuff. We'd always go, we'd always stop at the donut shop, man, and get, get our, it was, and you're right, we would buy a dozen donuts. We would. I would eat them all. Or maybe a half dozen. So, so, so maybe you're right. Maybe, maybe I would eat about six donuts at one time. So, <laughs> <laughs> Like, I just sit here, like, last night we were watching it together, and we were just sitting there laughing. We're like, man, there's no way this guy, because it's like, and it's funny, because the clips line up really well, because it's the woman talking, and she's like, his body, his build was sculpted by Michelangelo, <laughs> and then it's, 
he ate six jelly donuts at one time <laughs> at college. I was like, wait, this makes no sense. <laughs> I think we got to be human. We got to be realistic. And we have to, we have to, treat, you have to treat yourself. A hundred percent, yeah. So, somehow, no matter what you're doing, you have to have some release, some level of uh, something that you enjoy, you know. Yeah, a hundred percent. I think uh, as we start to like get to the end of this, uh, you know, there's a couple of things I want to ask that I didn't get the chance to ask before. So like, again, you were talking about the eras of wrestling, you know, there's obviously like, I want to say maybe four iconic eras, you know, you have uh, in freestyle leagues, you know, you have guys like Alexander Medved who are the pioneers of the sport. You know, if you go even way back, you have, uh, Johansson, Westergren from like Sweden or whatever, you know, you have the guys of, you know, your era, you have yourself, Dan Gable, a little bit beforehand. And then, you know, you said transitioning to the eighties, nineties, early two thousands, you know, Satiev just came on the scene. You had Fadzeev, you know, the Sergey and his brother, Kenny Monday, those guys. And now you have like these new age guys, you know, like Jordan Burrow, Sajulayev, David Taylor, Kyle Snyder, Gable Stevenson, who just did what he did this year. Like, probably one of the greatest athletes to ever compete in the sport if he wants to continue with this. Like, you know, yo, you've lived through a lot of this and seen a lot of this firsthand. Like, where do you think this leads the trajectory of our sport to with more and more kids on an everyday basis deciding to wrestle instead of? you know, maybe not doing a sport at all, maybe playing football, or maybe just, like, because wrestling isn't that big of a sport. Like, it wasn't at least a couple years ago, now it's just growing at a rapid rate. Well, my first thought is people like Gable Stevenson is helping wrestling grow. Because you'll have an app, because Gable, I I don't believe he played football. Um, No. I mean, he could have, probably, but... um, but, you, but my point is, you have a guy, a big guy, big athletic guy, who will see Gable Stevenson and might want to be a wrestler rather than just focus on football, you know? Or a young wrestler who see who maybe envisions they're going to be a big guy. You know, because you can tell when you're like 12, 13, you're going to be big or not, you know? A guy like that deciding to go the wrestling route. And they can make money, especially with, all the new things, the things we've talked about, NIL being one of them. So um, that's one thing that you see happening now too. It's not just Gable Stevens. It's like you could be a small guy and you see Spencer Lee, what he's doing. You know that, hey, I can I can be you know, great and have recognition and make a life uh, for myself uh, being a wrestler. So it encompasses all sizes and you have the great success of women wrestling. That's, I, so I think, Wrestling is a great sport. We all know it. Um, you all know it. Your your audience knows it. We just have to convince the rest of the world that it's great, you know. And I think that's part of highlighting people like Gable Stevenson, people like Jordan Burroughs, people like you know uh, some of the great women that are starting to, to to make some noise in wrestling now too. And and Greco too, you know. I mean, you know, we've got some. We've got some Greco wrestlers. Unfortunately, you know, the young man that didn't get to compete in the Olympic Games um, was unfortunate. But I see he's back out there competing, you know. Uh, and, I, and it seems like he's, uh, you know, come all bay, who I'm talking about. Yep. You know, and I'm sure you know who he is. And uh, he's the kind of guy that could draw people into Greco and wrestling. Because when you watch him wrestle, you, you, you want to do Greco, you know. So... Hopefully he'll be able to finish his career with some credentials, world credentials. He has some already in the junior yeah. level. He could be a senior level world champion, if not an Olympic champion. He can last to the next Olympic Games. Um, but he's not the only one. There's people like him that we can bring along. So it's 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 um, and then then you look at the venues like what you're doing. You know, you have you know a show that that you've been exposing wrestling and doing it at a high level. You have uh, media platforms like Flow Wrestling. They're doing things in a big way. 
you have things like Rudis, who just put on. I don't know if you attended the, which you maybe did at the national yeah, be twenty one. Yeah, we we probably I honestly God think we probably would have got invited if we were of age. But yeah, it was in a casino. You, you, you couldn't get in because there was so because yeah, there was so many alcohol. It was in no, it was in a casino. So you oh, you kidding me? Yeah. But the whole thing we didn't understand was the first opening match of the event was Mendez versus Swiderski, and they're both eighteen years old. So they were like. Yeah. He, yeah, they were allowed to compete inside the the match. Yeah, but I don't know. I don't know. But it was, we we didn't get invited. So, oh my gosh! But that's cool for wrestling. Yeah, that's cool for all wrestling. The, all those events. I know Flo does them. Rudis does them. Yeah, there's been some good events. Um, obviously, beat the streets in New York City this year. That's a yes. big one. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know. Like you said, ESPN posts every year and the numbers have gone insane. Like the viewership of nationals. Like I know people who like don't even like wrestling, but they're watching nationals, <laughs> like the national finals, just because like it's cool. Or like, oh, I've heard of Gable Steeson. Let me watch the national finals. <laughs> like it's stuff like that. Or like it's it's crazy. Like or even like guys that like went to college with these guys, like a couple of my friends go to Penn State and they're like, oh, like. I have a class with this guy. I have a class with RBY. Wow. Like, it's like these people are classmates. They're normal people. You know, it's 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 interesting. I think I think we do a really good job of you know spreading wrestling as a sport. And you know, we ask some fun questions. So you know, at the end, we kind of try to remind these people, like everybody who watches these videos, that like these are just normal guys. These are normal 19, 20, 21 year old guys that we're talking to. You know, like it's not just because they're a national champ doesn't mean that they're some kind of, you know, superstar. You know, they're at the end of the day, they're all human. So nice. Very nice. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, you know what? So, I think, uh, I think, you know, I think it'll be fun. So, we'll, you know, we'll ask you some fun questions that we usually <laughs> ask everybody because we were going to, we we're, we we're going to keep it a little serious, but. I think uh, I think it'll be good for everyone to get to know you a little bit, you know, a little on the fun side, on the non wrestling, a little bit personal. So uh, I'll mm-hmm. let you go first because his questions somehow always end up being wrestling related. So I'll let him go first. So okay. I already asked the first one I want to ask, but I think uh, this one is it varies a lot on person. You know, I think the one consistent answer we've gotten is David Taylor, but you wrestled in a different era, so you can't really say that. Or maybe you can't. I don't know. So your top three wrestlers of all time. Oh. That's it. Wow. And just a little bit of reason to why. Top top three American to put the Russians in there. Huh? You know how about this? Top three American, then top three international. Well, you know what? Um, now, Flow Wrestling obviously has tried to do this, as you know, right? Yeah. So their list was pretty interesting. I think 90 95 to 80% of it was probably how most people, even like yourself and me, would say. Yeah. So if I had to rank people, I mean, it would be very similar to how Flow Wrestling did. If you just have to cut it off at three, I mean, you've got to have Kale in there. You've got to have Dave. And you got to have John Smith. And then you got to boost bumper too. So, I mean, because those accomplishments cannot be pushed away. Those are some huge accomplishments. Yeah. Now, you could explain away the heavyweights aren't as tough and all that kind of crap, but, you know, that's not necessarily true. Now, you see Gable out there, you know. So, I mean, people try to criticize Bruce for wrestling so long because maybe it wasn't, you know, whatever. But yeah. I, I wrestled in teams with Bruce, man. Yeah. That, that's one it's, athletic, competitive guy who uh, was very impressed with. So, I don't know how to rank the four, but it's got to be those four. Yeah. I have Bruce number one, but before we get on me for that, I got my reasoning. Like, if he no, didn't you know have Gabedjishvili, I think that's what, what how you say his last name, in a lot of those yeah. world finals, like, that's another Olympic champions compete with. Yeah. You know, maybe it's not like Kyle Snyder where he's getting held off literally every gold medal by such a live, but mm-hmm. if Bruce didn't have that rivalry, he could very well go down as like the undisputed greatest freestyle wrestler of all time, or at least tied well, with Medved. Won. Well, you know, he won five world medals, yeah. golds. 
Yeah. You know, he won. He won two. He won two Olympic. Yeah, he won two Olympic. As you know, he won two Olympic gold medals. Yeah. And 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 three world titles, and then a lot. The more. other seven or eight or nine or ten medals are all silvers or bronzes. So, you know, I I, I was on teams with this guy, and he was for a big. And I I, I was around Russ Hudson as a big man too, and Bruce was definitely a couple of shades bigger than Russ. And I'd see Bruce. He's a guy who could do chin ups. To see a big man do 10 or 12, 13 chin ups, he was fast. He was agile and athletic. I mean, Bruce, Bruce and Gable, if they wrestled in their prime, that would be one match because a couple reasons. Bruce did not hold back. If you watch his matches, he always attacked. His conditioning was high and he wrestled hard. He was not holding back. Gable does the same thing. So you throw people like that together, you have some great matches. That's the problem with sometimes you have some great matchups that they're low scoring, like even on, uh, you know, they, uh, you know, um, Kyle Dake and Jordan Burroughs or whatever. There's low score, or even Snyder and, and uh, Jaden Cox. They're low scoring because they're so good. They're not going to risk a lot just trying to win. That wasn't the case with Bruce. Bruce always attacked hard. He tried, and so was Gable. So, so anyway, um, who's your number two? <laughs> I'm. I mean, I'm just speaking like basically all for like senior level accomplishments. So I got Burroughs, but I I think I'll put him above Johnson's my number three. I have him above John Smith because you know he has the you know the six right there. I mean, obviously mm-hmm. him not placing in Rio and not making the team for Tokyo kind of hinders that a bit. But I feel like his career is still going. You know, if he can just ride it till the end, he's going to be number two there. Mm-hmm. I agree. I I agree with that. And I think I'll go John Smith, number three. I do think Kyle Snyder's going to end up there when all is said and done. That's that's good. That's fair. I think that's fair. Okay. Yeah. That's my top three there. Derek, if you want to weigh in on this. Yeah. I'll, uh, I'll, like, I'll like that. I'm not a big like fan that. of that list. You're not? No. All right. Let's hear it. I'm going to keep um... – I'm going to agree with you on number one. Okay. I think 100% that that'll be my one as well. I'm going to take... Heavyweights, love that. Awesome. Two, I'm going to be... Two, I'm going to go Kyle Dake. I think Kyle, Kyle Dake, Dake at number two without an Olympic gold medal. Two. I, think, I, I just think his college career outweighs one Olympic medal. I think four. If you trade See, you, four... You can't say that, though. Four. That's the thing. You, <laughs> and then that, 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 that like, legitimately that means though. nothing. Like, it's all... <laughs> Senior level uh, accomplishments at that Sanders, point. Right. Number three is Kale right. Sanders. That's fine. We'll argue about this off camera, but you know. You guys can take it on the mat. You guys can go work out right now after this. You gotta get on the mat and sell it. Uh, we might have to, but uh, you know, uh, now top three senior level. This is a hard one. I think we'll go freestyle and Greco. Uh, the current senior level wrestlers right now? Anybody all time. This is wow. You know, I have to pull Gable into the mix because I w- I'm older and I remember the like this the 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 impact that Dan Gable had on wrestling is still it's as you know it's huge it's 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 bigger than anything you you can really explain because it doesn't necessarily make sense. If you look at just pure accomplishments, because, you know, he has one world title, one Olympic title, then why is he always at the top of everybody's list? And he won two national titles and didn't win a third one, you know? So there's some, just, if you just look at credentials, you might not even notice that he should be where people want to place him. But during the time period that the seventies, early seventies, when no one was winning world titles, he started to win them. I owe him the impact he had on me just being exposed to him to changing my whole career. So, you know, without Dan Gable, you wouldn't have a lot of wrestlers who end up being medalists of that. Like the Petersons would not have won world medalists because they trained with Dan. I would not because without his exposure, I went to a camp, he drilled with me. I got to see him and experience, you know, my stat stories in the, my documentary. So, uh, so second, 
second, um, it has to be John Smith. You know, I mean, J J John would be first for just pure accomplishments. The guy was technical. He was, he, he just, he was mentally tough. Uh, it's probably not fair to put him below Gable because he worked so hard to get there. It had to be John Smith. Gable would be kind of probably like third-ish for because it was a different time period. The fact that he is even in the top five is it shows you his strength of his of his uh, aura that he brought to wrestling. Is this list right now including like all countries or just like? No, no, no. You no. you bring. If you bring Russian, it, then you've got to have the Bell Glossops, um, okay. Satya, you know, those names. What would be your list if, like, just any wrestler to ever live, if you had to go top well, three? There. I, I have to go by people that I am familiar with, because there yeah. probably are more. But during my era, there is uh, a wrestler called Vladimir Human. You might look him up. He he was very technical. He he was a 36 pounder somewhere in there. I watched him win several world titles. He won the Olympic title too back in '80. <clears throat> the Belgovsovs are in there, of course. Sergey and Anatoly. Uh, Satya, both Satya brothers were good. I mean, they they were both extremely talented. That. And I keep thinking about it. And then, then you have, um, you alluded to him. Um, I'm trying to think of um, Teddy Tarashavili. If you watch his matches from the 72 Olympics and when he beat the Peter, he beat both Petersons in two different Olympic games. For a big man, very technical, um, Teddy Tarashavili. That's the era that I come from, watching people like him win world titles, watching the Belovazovs, because Sergey and I are, the, cause they're twins, but we're the same age. Yeah. You know, he's 65-ish. So um, I watched him wrestle when he was, I mean, I was in the first world tournament he was in, in 1978 and 79. I mean, I was there rep competing when he was just, but because of the system of Russia, he, he's, he wrestled much longer. You know, he's almost like a professional athlete there. So, um, but if, and I, Tell my son to watch their technique. I say, you know, I need you to go watch Sergey Belovazov. I send him a link. You know, watch, um, you know, Vladimir Yuin. Although there, you can't find any video of him wrestling today. I've, I've got an old tape of him, but but yeah, um, from the world level. Uh, wow. I, I think that's, that's kind of like at the top of that one too. And then you have to add Jordan Burroughs to that because Jordan is equal, but John has done uh, from a volume, you know, world gold standpoint. Jordan has all these other medals to add to that. But his goal is to win this, this world championship that, that he's going to try to make this next team, as you know. I mean, he's decided he's going to accept the bid to be in the final X. And if he makes the world team, you better believe he'll be there to win his sixth gold medal. And he could do it. He could do it, which would, for the time period that he wins it until the time period that someone else wins six or seven, he will be the goal. He will be the, the thing that he's been chasing since he started. And he didn't make, he didn't, he wasn't shy about saying that he wanted to be the, you know, he wanted to be the greatest wrestler in America. He wanted to accomplish more than anyone. And I understand that thinking because that's kind of how I was thinking when I was going into wrestling as a young man, as a, you know, my, my first world championship in 1978. Absolutely. That's what I wanted to do. Yeah. That's probably the best response I've gotten to that question so far. So, yeah, definitely. I mean, Derek, if you um, want to take it away. All right. Yeah. I mean, I'll ask our last question to wrap it up here. Um, so, you know, we usually ask a dumb question, you know, for the college guys, but for you, we'll make it a little bit more serious. Um, if you could sit down and have a dinner with one influential person that was in your life that, you know, helped your career, um, you know, anything like that. If you could sit down and have a meal with them right now, dead or alive, who would it be? This is pertaining to my wrestling career or just the life mm -hmm. in general? Your wrestling, wrestling career. career. Yeah. Well, 
I was fortunate enough to be with people to help my career as it developed. But the people that I didn't, that I wish I would have, that I always looked up to and respected, um, unfortunately would, would have had it been people that, that unfortunately had passed away. Some of the wrestling greats that I never got a chance to meet personally, because I got to meet pretty much all the wrestling greats after that. So if I had to pick one that I wish I could just sit with now, um, it might, you know, it might be someone like, um, you know, I always looked up to Doug Blue Ball, you know, I remember his Olympic gold medal in 1960, where he pinned the Iranian that had never lost before. That was an amazing, and I got to see a clip of that moment that he pinned this Iranian. So uh, I never got to know Doug Blue Ball that well, I knew of him. I would love to have sat to be able to sit down with him right now and talk to him about, because he loved wrestling. He loved life in general. Uh, so the blue ball might be one person that I never got a chance to sit down with in terms of my wrestling career. Um, it might be, um, wow, it might be someone like, uh, might be someone like Dan Hodge, you know? That, you know, he, he He's legendary, you know. So I never I met him once, never got never got to really get to know him. So to sit down with him might be something pretty cool. Uh, to sit with Dan Hodge and maybe as my mind is racing about people I would have wanted to sit and you know, I, I heard that Sugar Ray Leonard wrestled. You may have heard that too. Mm -hmm. So it would be cool to sit down with Sugar Ray Leonard, a great competitor. And to talk to him about his short-lived wrestling career and what he thinks of wrestling. I've heard him speak about it before. He really respects wrestlers quite a bit. Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously, Mr. Kemp, this is probably one of our most prestigious and best episodes we've ever had. Um, obviously, we appreciate you for giving us your time. Um, obviously, uh, we know you're probably super busy, so we appreciate you sitting down with us and talking. And obviously, tell the fans out there if you haven't, go watch Wrestled Away, the Lee Kemp story. Um, probably one of the most influential. Yeah, it'll be linked in the description. Um, your whole website will be linked in the description, but uh, probably one of the most uh, influential wrestling movies you could watch. I mean, there's not many good wrestling movies out there that are, you know, true to story that take you through somebody's life. So I definitely go recommend it. It's Wrestled Away, the Lee Kemp story. Thank you so much. Yeah. I really appreciate you inviting me on on your podcast, on your episode, your podcast, and uh, and really, especially appreciate you having my son on. That was yeah, really pretty cool, and uh, yeah. he was excited about it, and um, and I really appreciate what you guys are doing to, to grow the sport of wrestling. Thank you. Thank you. So, you know, uh, I really appreciate having you on, you know, obviously, as uh, Derek said, probably our most prestigious guest, you know, by far, and this is Great talk, you know, it's great to be able to sit down with the legend of the sport. So, you know, thank you guys for watching. This has been episode 111 Late Night Shots. We'll see you guys again next time.